Uh, good evening. Uh, I am a group of one, and we're going to, I guess I am going to um, discuss uh, this week's case study, which is for Cake Financial. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in. Um, the key elements of Cake's Financial, I wanted to go over each of those. Customer value proposition. The customer value proposition that they offered was a couple of things. They were going to provide access to research by industry professionals, um, by people in the business that were uh, going to help provide uh, um, recommendations on how to invest. They were going to put uh, kind of a forum together that gave its users an opportunity to, to have access to that. Uh, the other value that they were going to provide was uh, a social networking piece where individual investors could share information with other investors, friends could share information with friends about um, uh, some things that uh, they're investing in. So uh, just as just for informational um, purposes. So those are a couple of the key uh, key information um, value propositions, if you will. Um, the go-to-market plan was to first um, acquire funding. They did that through angel investors, through uh, venture capitalists. They raised the capital. They created the uh, the website, the uh, interface, and they did uh, market research. And then once they felt comfortable, they went to market. Uh, they went to the general public with that. Technology and operations strategy was to bring on people who came from uh, an IT background, the individual that they, the engineers and so forth, and the individual that they finally partnered with had some um, experience with uh, eBay and others um, where they had <clears throat> um, brought this model. Um, they had a lot of experience in this, in this field. And their cash flow formula consisted of um, a couple of different sources of revenue. Uh, they would um, advertise, and they were going to provide three revenue streams, including advertising, lead generation, and sponsorship fees paid by brokerage firms and financial providers. They would get premium services for customers, um, sub subscription-based um, services. Uh, with regard to stock alerts and top performing portfolios, etc. And then that was the second. The last was data licensing fees from financial institutions, uh, financial information providers, and hedge funds. So that was the, that was the idea. Okay. Um, was Cake Dune from the beginning or was this a promise? Um, or was this a promise business, promising business model? I don't think Cake was doomed from the beginning, but they had a lot of issues, I think, that uh, they failed to realize. The first is, this is a very cash-intensive business. It's not something that you can start off really small and then grow over time. It's something that from day one requires significant amount of money, millions of dollars of money. The other issue is that it's not a proprietary business. They didn't create a proprietary, um, any proprietary software. They didn't create any proprietary products. Um, this was something that they had created, uh, but anybody else could have created the same tool or same um, um, resource. Uh, in other words, Fidelity could have done this, E-Trade, Ameritrade. Um, you know, any of the brokerage firms could have created the same uh, tool where they provide you access to uh, industry professionals, where they have a social media link if that was going to be successful. So there wasn't anything proprietary about what they were creating. It was something that anyone could come along and copy if they so chose, you know, if they chose to. And so uh, it required a lot of cash, and it was um, not un it was unique for its time, but it was something that could be repeated by someone else who had bigger resources and uh, experience in the industry. And the other thing was they came in, into it at a really bad time in the financial meltdown where uh, brokerage firms and institutions were, they were just watching their bottom dollar. And so there was sort of a, it was kind of a perfect storm. Okay. Beginning with those who say it was a promising business model, let the group 
uh, know what they like about it. Provide a convincing argument in favor of the business. What evidence from the case can you support your position? I think there was some good things in the business model. Uh, the idea that they could connect, you know, investors with access to research and the way institutional funds and top in investors were investing, and they could they could have access to that information and share that with their users. I think was really powerful. Uh, so that was a good thing. I think that they certainly have a, um, there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers in investing. I, I'm actually in the financial services industry and we provide a service. Most of our clients are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. A lot of younger people prefer to go the route that was um, that was designed through um you know, kick financial where they want to do it yourself. They want to pick their own funds, pick their own stocks, and they don't want some someone to give them advice for a fee. They would rather do a low cost way. And so I think there's certainly, uh, I think it's an attractive model for some investors who like to do it themselves. They need expert advice, but they want it in as low cost uh, avenue as possible. And I think that's what they were catering to. Um, I think they also had a lot of, um, you know, they worked with a lot of brokerage firms, which I think was important for them to be successful. Uh, they obviously learned early on they needed to work with more than just 12. Uh, I think that was uh, another big part. I also think that, um, I mean, it seems like they had quite a bit of a tailwind when it came to um, being recognized by, you know, some of the media attention that they got. Some of the, um, they were able to have kind of a big footprint in the technology space. They went right behind Mint in terms of the uh, uh, technology award. And so I think, and their their uh, experience is very similar. It sounds like to Mint. Mint is a great. Um, service. I think what they offer at uh, Kick Financial seemed like another great uh, idea, uh, given that it was similar to Mint. Okay. Next, allow the those who feel Kate was doomed from the outlet try to convince group Y, which assumptions turned out to be false. Okay, well, I, I kind of addressed why it was doomed to be false or doomed to fail. I think it was too cash intensive. It wasn't a startup where you could start off with 50,000 or 100,000 or several hundred thousand. It needed millions of dollars to start up. And even when that uh, initial funding came, they needed more money uh, in order to create the right experience online. Um, I also think that it wasn't proprietary. Anybody could have come along and created a mousetrap that was like theirs and integrated some of the, the features that they had. So uh, that was a key. I think the biggest failure, though, and this was hit on in the in the in the case study, was simply the social media aspect. There, most of the investors that said were male, and males don't participate in social media. I also think that in that type of forum, uh, social media is not going to be as important. If, for example, you know, I have a hot stock tip, I don't think the answer is to go and share it with the rest of the world because, frankly, that's just going to um, well, I, I guess I guess that's counterintuitive, but I think part of the problem is people's individual uh, risk tolerances are different, their time horizons are different. So I may not invest list just like my dad. He may like dividend paying, um, income based investments. I may be looking for more growth and high beta um, type stocks. So there's going to be different type of investors, and I think that the social media aspect was doomed from the beginning. People just weren't interested in that. Next, discuss Steve's approach to the opportunity. Try to understand what, if anything, Steve could have done differently that may have produced a better outcome. Okay. Um, I think he should have done a light version that was a low cost approach where they release it to users and they work out the kinks and they improve upon it over time. I think they went for the gusto and they try to have the best product from day one. They spent 
an enormous amount of research and time and money and resources and capital trying to design this model that they felt was best for users and they realized after spending millions of dollars that the social media aspect wasn't that interesting they realized very early on some of the kinks with this I think if they would have done a soft launch and allowed it to grow um, on its own and not been so capital intensive and in terms of the amount of money that it needed um, I think that would have probably been a better business idea. They wouldn't have run out of money in 2008, 2009 when the financial markets had melted down and they may have survived long enough to make it successful. Um, so I think those are a few of the things that I think led to its their ultimate demise. Uh, on page three it says, Steve, uh, Steve says, in retrospect, I'm not sure that these early focus groups were helpful. They validated our high-level con concept, but we did not seek feed feedback on a specific product. Well, uh, I've learned that focus groups for technical products can be unreliable because people can't always say what they want until they can actually see see it and play around with it. Uh, we would have learned more by building a lightweight product and watching how investors use it. Uh, we also didn't get much sense of user segmentation from our early focus groups. Later we learned that there are important but suitable differences, or subtle differences rather, between active investors who track their performances daily, portfolios daily rather, and mainstream investors who pay less attention. So again, they spent a lot of money on focus groups, but the focus groups really, um, it sounds like because it was all conceptual, they didn't really have some of the feedback they needed in order to, um, in order for it to be successful, if you will. Um, the um, uh, the focus groups, I, th I think the user experience can't, we can't fully get some of the correct feedback until users actually experience it and see how it works and then they can appreciate if it's great or if it's not. Um, but until then, it's all theoretical. So I think some of the focus groups were um, were doomed. I also think that, like it said here, um, there are different types of investors. There are daily investors, very active traders. And then there are some who want to put it in an asset allocation model and, um, and then just periodically rebalance it, but pretty much just leave it alone. Um, they should have catered to those individual investors. You know, for investors who want to be very active, they could have made it more of a fee-based, subscription-based, providing more and more research and analytics, and um, you know they could have had CFAs, uh, you know that that basically provide um, financial analysis for you know got in the weeds and looked at some of the you know some of the stock indicators and portfolio indicators. They could have had a more in-depth and broad. Um, model for active day traders. Now for the passive investor who's looking for basic advice, um, they could have provided a different level of engagement uh, with the user and done a, maybe a lower cost model. Um, but I think there could have been, you know, some maybe some different things. If they would have identified those different segments of investors, they could have maybe provided a more specific uh, product for each of them. On page 10, Steve says, there's no way um, there's no way you could have learned this up uh, front through interviews or focus groups. There's a lot of precedent pointing to a strong social component, including investor clubs and active communities on sites like Raging Bull. So I guess, again, they looked at, uh, you know, some of the investor community. If you look at some of the comments section of um, some of these you know, comments in Raging Bull and Motley Fool and investment clubs and those kinds of things. There's a lot of people who interact with with each other, and and I guess that's, um, you know, that was to their point. But, um, you know, as a whole, is that can we use that as an example for the entire broad market? There's a lot of people who um, read those. Um, commentaries but who choose not to participate in the comment section and so um, I don't think those um, 
things are necessarily a precursor to what it could have been. Uh, investment clubs are, you know, and they mentioned that, and that's key, but I think that's um, maybe a little bit different situation. As a group, can you come up with a list of ways Stephen's approach is different than Rent the Runway, uh, Dropbox, or Mint? How do you know which assumption to test first? Okay, so some different uh, a different approach to Rent the Runway, Dropbox, and Mint. I think there's a lot of ways that it's um, very similar, I think, to Dropbox. Um, not as much Rent the Runway because Rent the Runway is more, uh, it requires more um, inventory. And uh, I think, hmm. can you come up with a list of ways Steve's approach is different than Rent the Runway, Dropbox, and Mint? I don't, I am very familiar with Mint and I don't know Cake Financial, so I don't know enough to know how it's different than Mint. Um, Mint is more of an aggregate where they, it, it doesn't provide a lot of common, well, I mean, it provides some recommendations and feedback and other things, but really the value that comes to the user is to take from these different um, accounts and so forth and create reports in a online Quicken type approach where you can have access to how you spent your money and um, what you know what's your budget and keeping you accountable and that kind of thing I think that's what this was trying to accomplish because it was going to have the various brokerage accounts maybe you had a, T, a TD Ameritrade and maybe you also had a Fidelity account or a Schwab account and so they were going to aggregate and they were basically going to funnel into one and it was going to link you with investor advice and so forth so I think on the surface that's good um, Way Steve's approach is different than rent the one way Dropbox and Mint. You know, I just honestly I see a lot of similarities. I don't know that I see a lot of differences. Um, you know, I guess with the business brand. Now the approach was a little bit different, so let me just touch on that because I guess that's really what the question is. Dropbox, um, I don't know, I can't speak to Mint's um, necessarily their approach, but rent the runway and Dropbox tried to go as low cost as possible. Dropbox did a kind of a soft launch. They uh, they tried to get you know go to the, the consumers, but you know, and they improved along the way, you know, incorporating some of the, that feedback. But they really tried to go in in as least cost, most affordable way as possible. Try to launch their their product and and do so in a way that wasn't going to be too capital intensive for them. Rent the Runway had a similar approach. They initially went to designers and said, "We're going to provide this model." Um, you, we'd like you to provide us the dresses and they came up with some sort of arrangement because they didn't want to purchase a ton of inventory so again there was really a focus on trying to keep costs down I don't see that same focus with uh, Cake Financial it seemed like from the outset there was a lot of costs that they had from day one and I think it really just ate them up so I think that would be one of the key differences. Okay. Um, how do you know which assumption to test first? Was building the data layer first the right approach? Which would you have done? Um, I would say this generally is a rule of thumb. Uh, and if you don't have a proprietary product, I don't believe he did. It's something that anybody else could have copied. He didn't. Uh, create a you know patentable type product I would think in that situation and in most situations starting a new business it's better to go with a low-cost approach uh, in very in most instances you end up um, in, incurring losses on the front end of your business until it launches and becomes successful so I think to do a soft launch and kind of work through some of the kinks uh, and not put to put forward the best and perfect product right from day one is probably the way to go I think um, it's gonna have some hiccups along the way but if the product as a whole is a good one uh, you can overcome that and you can fix that and I think with the right feedback from consumers and the experience you'll gain uh, over time I think there's a lesson there's a learning curve if you will uh, from the outset those things are are able to you're able to refine and, and improve your product over time. 
I think he wanted the best product day one and it cost him a lot of money and it didn't win him from day one a huge amount, you know, a huge following and it took a long time for him to get, you know, even tens of thousands of users, uh, hundreds of thousands of users and, and at the same time his money, his business was rather was hemorrhaging cash and he limped into the financial meltdown, almost broke. So his was kind of a timing thing. I think they should have waited, um, or rather I think they should have launched and worked through some of these kinks over time and gone with a low cost, um, good but not great, not perfect kind of product and then worked through some of the kinks over time. Uh, as a group, identify the main reason for Cake's uh, failure. Was the failure just beyond Steve's control? I think yes. Um, the financial meltdown, I think, certainly hurt him. Had that not happened in 2008, 2009, or 2008 really, um, you know, that may have um, allowed his business to finally turn the curve and be successful. I think it was too uh, heavy in terms of cash, um, so I think that certainly hurt him, which is on him. But um, there are some instances where it was beyond his control. Um, which failure uh, was the failure just um, just beyond Steve's control? So yeah, I think it was beyond Steve's control. I think there were some failures on his part. I think there was also some bad luck on his part with the financial meltdown and with some of the hiccups they've had in their system and working through some of the kinks. The low cost experiment that he could have done um, to test assumptions behind the main reason for the failure, or what low cost experiment could he have done rather. The low cost experiment was just to put together the best product possible and then launch and then work through some of the some of the kinks. They didn't need to have, you know, maybe starting out you only take the top five brokerage firms instead of the top 12 or 70 uh, and, and you do that with the understanding that over time it's going to build. Maybe you do you you provide um, industry research and feedback from the top three or four or five uh, research places. You know, maybe you try to more narrow your focus and and do a may, maybe a more low cost approach um, in the launch and not try to go big and and then understand that over time with additional users and additional capital and additional revenue that you know that it's going to eventually um, have some of these other things I think they wanted to treat be all things uh, to all people day one and I just think it was too much um, so anyway that's my take on